Hello. Thank you for joining me today uh, at Postcolonial Space. Today, I'll be briefly talking about Edward Said's really important concept world of uh, worldliness. Uh, Said uh, writes about this. Actually, it's the main theme of his work, The World, the Text, and the Critic. One of his major books comes out after Orientalism. And in the introductory parts of the book, what Said is suggesting is what he calls secular criticism. And by that, what he means is that all of us exist in a secular history. <clears throat> and secular criticism would be a kind of criticism which is aware of its own political leanings and is not really overdetermined by them. And in order to make that claim and uh, argue for that point, he discusses the two aspects of our loyalties as individuals and critics in the world. And that is the affiliative and affiliative aspects of our identities. So the affiliative aspects of what you, me, and anyone else is, and also the critics is, of course, the family bonds, the family, the given of the family that determines our politics or our worldviews. But most of the times we outgrow it through our affiliative structures, the university we went to, people we study with, politics that we adopt. And most of the time as critics, it's our affiliative leanings that determine how we read texts and how we write about them. But something else also happens in the process. And that is that our affiliative structures, our affiliative alignments start predetermining how we read the texts and how we write about them. And in that sense, then Saeed would suggest that our affiliative alignments become kind of affiliative because they overdetermine how we read texts or how we think about literature. Now, Said argues on page 35 about the texts, right? And he says that all texts, no matter how rarefied, how unique, are worldly because they exist in the world. They were compiled and composed in the world and that the critics read them in the world. Hence, the best form of secular criticism would then be a criticism that is worldly. Worldly in a sense that it acknowledges that the text doesn't exist beyond the exigencies of life, beyond history, but also worldly in a sense that the critic, his or herself, also may take an objective position, but in the end, the critic also exists in the world. So hence, worldliness then is keeping in mind the very existential worldliness, worldliness of the text itself because it exists in the world, because it was created in the world. It most of the times responds to the world or represents the world. And that the critic, his or herself, is also worldly and is in the world. Keeping both of these things in mind while reading a text or while writing about a text will then create a kind of worldly criticism, a criticism that is aware that what we do as critics doesn't just happen in the ivory tower, but has actual consequences in the world or should have actual consequences in the world. And on the other hand, it will be the kind of criticism that would be aware of my own worldliness my own prejudices, preferences, or my own positions in the world. And maybe by knowing that, we will then create a habit of a secular criticism, a criticism that just doesn't push one agenda or the other, but rather deals with the text and its implications for the world and acknowledges our own limitations as scholars too. So overall, worldliness is a really, really wonderful concept for all literary scholars to understand. This is just a brief introduction, but I strongly 
urged you to read the word, the text, and the critic, and then see how it impacts your work and your scholarship and your pedagogy. If you have any further questions, if you would like me to elaborate a little more, because this is kind of a reductive um, discussion of the concept, please uh, feel free to add it in the comments or send me an email at postcolonial.net and I'll be very happy to record another such um, brief video for you. And uh, as always, thank you so much for joining me and I will see you next time.